Hello, everybody. Welcome to this conversation about BART's Dogmatics and Outline. I'm Will Willeman, and I'm joined by my colleague, Stanley Harawas. Uh, some years ago, Stanley was asked to r select right on his what he thought was the most important books for pastors, theologians to be reading. And he chose Dogmatics and Outline for First Things Magazine. By the way, you can see Stanley's article at on my blog site, uh, willwilliman.com. Uh, in the summer of 1946, uh, right about the time that I was being born, uh, Karl Barth decided to offer a seminar for some of his colleagues at the University of Bonn. And he conducted this seminar 7.30 in the morning in the ruins of the uh, Kurfürstenschloss there at Bonn. And there was a big hole in the middle of the ceiling and uh, beams were down. They had to do it at 7.30 in the morning because construction was starting uh, to rebuild the university by, by 8.30. Uh, but those lectures became uh, dogmatics and outline. And they're what we will be working through in these conversations. We're going to take the first four uh, chapters. By the way, there are some useful discussion questions that our friend Ralph Wood has provided. Those are also at my uh, website. Uh, Stanley, uh, Bart begins in the, his forward to the uh, American edition of these lectures. He says, uh, the subject of theology is the history of communion with God with man and man with God. Uh, that seems to me a, a kind of fitting introduction to this. What, what do you think is a fitting introduction to uh, dogmatics and outline these lectures? I think it, it's interesting that Bart doesn't call attention uh, to the fact that um, the Apostles' Creed was probably a baptismal creed, and that uh, it, even though he wants to stress uh, so importantly that it was and is uh, a church um, document that um, makes it important to realize that what he's doing in dogmatics is not systematic theology. As he says in the foreword, systematic <laughs> theology is like wooden iron <laughs> paradox, which uh, I think, um, and he, 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 interestingly enough, he, he has Tillich in mind. And what he was concerned to defeat was any suggestion that um, theology is like a philosophical position because you're not systematically trying to establish the grounds on which you can say anything, but the grounds are already established by God in a manner that you are to correspond to them. So belief is already determined by what you can say about God. And what you can say about God is what God makes possible. It's a, um, I, I've always thought that there is a deep commonality between Bart's moves in that regard and what Wittgenstein was doing and helping us discover that we don't, mm. We don't make up our mind about what we believe, but our beliefs are already making up our mind. Hmm. Uh, he does, there's not much kind of introduction. He, he just uh, kind of typical of Bart begins uh, by what we've got. And what we've got is God's uh, self-revelation. Uh, hey, by the way, it, it looks like we've maxed out at our 500 participants. I wanted to mention that this this will all be recorded and posted uh, for anybody who can't get in. Also, uh, wanted to say that the Q and A function at the bottom of the screen—that's a way that you can put in questions or comments 
And uh, Carson Bryant, one of our students, is busy monitoring those, and we'll deal with some of those toward the end of the session. Uh, yeah, Stanley points out that uh, Bart kind of begins with a dismissal of systematic theology as a kind of oxymoron. And uh, we begin with what God has said. It, it is interesting, Stanley, you note that uh, he's working from the Apostles' Creed, but he doesn't mention that that's a baptismal formula, that's a baptismal creed. And I would say that throughout dogmatics and outline, uh, the baptism, the church, is just sort of assumed. Uh, I think of what you have said about Bonhoeffer is that Bonhoeffer, friend of Bart's, uh, sort of worked with the assumption that the church is and the church will always be. We, in our context, may be not so sure that the church that we know can be assumed. There may be a sense of the church uh, dwindling. Uh, Bart was um, um, aware that um, the ecclesial issue was not easily resolved. I'm going to be boorish and read a footnote from Mind of the Grain of the Universe on that. Go right ahead. Um, um, I say Bart used the scripture and classical creeds of the church, where I believe is an attempt to deal with the problem of authority. In the essay, Church and Theology, written in 1925, Bart calls attention to an exchange between Harnack and Patterson, in which Harnack challenged Patterson to name which dogmas and which century for which church should have authority. Bart sides with Patterson, maintaining that theology requires that the theologian identify with this or that profession of faith or this or that branch of the church, together with, with this or that presupposed affirmation of the ancient church on which the confession ultimately rests. Yet Bart confesses that the sad truth is, is that his answer is still his own and however well grounded the answer may be, it remains only his answer. He continues, here the church must bear the responsibility for considered answer, even if it's only a small regional church or a general synod, which would be the legitimate representative of such a church. A fundamental cause of the weakness of our present day theology is the fact that when we pursue theology, we have no church behind us which has the courage to say to us, um, uh, which has the courage uh, uh, to say to us um, uh, unambiguously that so far as we talk together, this and this is the highest concreteness. If unambiguously that, that so far as we talk together, this and this is the highest concreteness. If the churches do not say this to us, and yet demand that we learn and teach dogmatics, the churches do and say thus to us, and yet demand that we learn and teach dogmatics. And truly, like Nebuchadnezzar, who demanded that the wise men not only tell him what his dream meant, but also what he had dreamed. <laughs> <laughs> I think that that is why Bart uh, was so concerned to try to avoid the idea of system and the idea that Tillich was the exemplification of that because it makes it sound like that the theologians themselves bring and make what we say as Christians meaningful. And rather why. than rather than the church is witness being coming to the theologians. Right, right. Hmm. Behind that is uh, Bart's, uh, and this is oftentimes not um, uh, indicated, is, is Bart's dislike of pietism. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, he, he thought pietism was really uh, the breeding ground for Protestant liberalism. Yeah. And I think that's right. And he gets, he gets into that. Uh... How about the, the first sentence of the first lecture is uh, dogmatics is a science. Right. In what sense is theology scientific? Well, he, he says, 
he um, he gives his account of what science is. Um, I I propose that by science we understand an attempt at comprehension and exposition, and investigation and instruction, which is related to a definitive object and sphere of activity. So um, I think a way to understand what he means by science is the German mission off. You, you can say it better than I can. Mission off is kind, the kind of science that's wisdom, not um, uh, not didactic in, um, uh, in a sense that this is the way it's got to be. Science mm. is a practical, um, um, a practical um, object. Practical wisdom? Yeah, I think. We, I mean, because wisdom involves beliefs that can be other. And so okay. you have to show the, yeah. the significance of the other. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I hear uh, in this Theology of Science, one, uh, he, he says, in every science, an object is involved, a sphere of activity. Uh, I hear in that a call, one, for strict attentiveness to the object and he's, he's being very <laughs> kind of, yeah, intentionally controversial to speak of God as object. Uh, and yet he's got a whole thing about that. Uh, also, I hear um, that one characteristic of scientific methodology is strict attentiveness and strict limitation to the object of study that, uh, I think of some times that you have noted how language tends to be as complicated as it needs to be to be adequate to the object under study. For instance, you, you can't do physics without learning a whole vocabulary, a whole language. And it is a language specific to the study of matter and motion that physics does. Well, it seems like Barks claiming the same thing about theology that Theology, it's its the object of study that determines how we're able to converse about it. Which means your language will never be adequate because your object is God. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. And, he, on and Bart keeps, that's a theme throughout his thing about that our language is inadequate. Uh, you know, we make statements like, we cannot preach. But then he always follows that up before the end of the sentence with, but we must preach, and our language is inadequate, and yet, Bart would say, it is sufficient to be able to say meaningful things about God, uh, because the object under study is busy revealing himself to us. Right. The, uh, uh, on 18, he says, uh, I believe it is itself a recognition of faith to recognize that God is to be known only through God himself. And if we can repeat this in faith, it means I give praise and thanks for the fact that God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is what he is and does what he does and has disclosed and revealed himself to me and determined himself for me and for himself. That sense of activity, that God is activity as embodied in language, I think is just extraordinary. Uh, divine activity in the language on page 18 and we're using this you know the dogmatics and outline Harper Torch books which I got when I was a sophomore in college read it could make a thing of it uh, but uh, uh, I love this sentence and it says uh, uh, to, to think about God here on page 18 I make use of the gift in which God has given me himself. I breathe. And now I breathe joyfully and freely in the freedom which I have not taken to myself, which I have not sought nor found by myself, but in which God has come to me and adopted me. It, it is a very active view of God speaking, God's revealing. And uh, 
I love that sense about we, we can actually say things, truthful things about God because God has come and adopted us into this conversation. Uh, I, I do think that's important because in modernity, uh, there is this thing about uh, God is essentially unknowable. Uh, that, you know, it, it, it's intellectually arrogant for you to think you can actually say something definitive about God. And uh, God is apophatic. God is inexpressible, uh, unknowable. And Bart really wants to tackle that. The, um, um, it, it's interesting, of course, the, the famous Anselm, um, uh, book, Bart um, suggested that Anselm's great, uh, God is that which um, nothing greater can be conceived, um, was a grammar that expressed what at least we, we mean by beginning um, to say God, and God's such a tricky word. But um, I think that there is deeper commonality than in terms of what Bart is doing with trying to expose the grammar of the difficulty of what you know you're saying when you say God. Um, that's being uncovered by people like um, Stephen Mulhall today, uh, an Oxford philosopher, uh, who's written a terrific book called The Great Riddle um, that I think is closer to Bart than many people uh, have, and hmm. that people would be going. I mean, Aquinas later will be reading soon. He says, a Christian father once rightly said that Joyce non est in genre. Um, uh, God is not a particular instance within a class. He, that particular father was Aquinas. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Bach knows he's, he's treading around in fundamental issues theologically of how to speak of God. Yeah. In a way yeah. that is. I, I guess, um, I don't know whether this is the preacher in me, but um, uh, Bart certainly speaks about that our theological thoughts can be in error. Uh, our language has a kind of proximate quality about it, a fragility that it doesn't lose. At the same time, as somebody like reading this book from this vantage point, um, I'm, I'm just impressed that uh, that there's a kind of no nothingism that that's abroad, which which uh, I, I wonder if today Bart would think, uh, gosh, it's maybe much more important for me to say we actually can speak of God because God has spoken to us. We actually know something about God. We are not left alone. Well, 14 volumes of church talk. Uh, that's a lot of talk about God. Uh, now, you know, um, this maybe moves us into like uh, chapter two on faith, which to me, I love this sentence. Uh, it, it is interesting to me that Bart begins not as like he begins in the dogmatics with the Trinity and with God. He begins here uh, by uh, talking about dogmatics as a science. And then he says, then, then these chapters, these first chapters are all about faith, which can almost seem like, oh my, Bart is beginning with us. He's beginning with, uh, but then you get into it and you find out, no, he's defining faith a different way. Here's, here's a sentence I like. Christian faith is the gift of the meeting in which men become free to hear the word of grace which God has spoken in Jesus Christ in such a way that in spite of all that contradicts it, they may once for all exclusively, exclusively and entirely hold to his promise 
and guidance. He, he calls that the nature of faith. Right. What impresses you about that sentence? I, um, uh, I think um, it's very important to see what he's trying to do is not let faith become a subjectivistic experience that it, of yeah. the pietist, yeah. Faith really is a, um, a a gift, and a gift you don't get to determine what its character is if it's a gift. So, yeah, um, I, I like I like his image of meeting, which he uses in a number of places in this section. That you know, meeting means that you're actually being encountered by something other than yourself, right. and Wow, that seems to me a radically different view of faith than I hear the word faith used. I, I believe, thank you, pietism, and then good old American subjective individualism. Uh, faith is thought of as something that arises within me, something I have, something a characteristic of me, and boy, Bart really goes after that in this section. I have a, um, again, I, I hope it's not boorish, but I have um, a quote about that from his, um, these three volumes, Bart in Conversation. Yeah, great book. They're, they're just terrific. And he, you see the liveliness of, uh, of him. And uh, this is um, a question um, by, in a meeting that he had with Methodist pastor. And he's asked, in your opinion, does the Methodist Church and its proclamation and its existence exhibit deviations from the gospel from which it must be recalled? Bart responds, are you aware that there's a relationship between the problem of liberalism and the problem of John Wesley? With Wesley, one can become a very good liberal. In America, Methodism is quite liberal. This is the case when one is about to make the human being the point of focus. You, the Methodists, may not declare yourselves free of guilt or solidarity with liberalism as a point of departure. A great anthropocentric train is at your doorstep. Do you imagine, whoever you <laughs> are, that when the judge, that when you judge those who do such things, you imagine whoever you are, and then you judge those who do such things, and yet do them yourself, and you will escape the judgment of God? Romans 2. That is the only thing that I want to say to you. I will not say that you're becoming deviant, but the danger is there. A good friend, as a good friend, I would advise you, be careful. Place the emphasis more on Christ and less on the experience of salvation. <laughs> oh, uh, well, it's very painful. Uh, yeah, so true. Uh, uh, that, that concluding sentence in his comment about, be real careful. Uh, Keep it focused on Christ and not your experience of Christ. Um, the um, Bart had said that theology began in the 19th century began with a, it. We stopped talking about God and we started talking about our experience of God mm -hmm. and analyzing that. Uh, here he wants to claim an objectivity of faith. Faith, faith is having been met. Faith is having been encountered, having been addressed. It's not my own appropriation. And uh, it's also it's, uh, page 16, I believe in, credo in means I am not alone. Right. Well, I, I think that's, that's amazing. Uh, then he gets in that when we hear this word, uh, would you say that I'm thinking he defines faith? Who is what is faith? Faith is having heard something. Uh, faith is simply having uh, heard something. Well, it's interesting that he 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 raises the issue of trust as okay. central to faith. And um, I think that there's such a tendency to want to take, to make faith 
a set of beliefs in things that are really hard to believe rather than uh, to be, to have one's life, to discover one's life is made possible by a being that is capable of loving me in spite of who I am and therefore creates the conditions of trust uh -huh. that I can live with an enthusiasm for the gift of life that is otherwise absurd if this God is not the God revealed in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, you know, uh, Tillich had used, had said trust is a, another word for faith. And so I was a little nervous when Mark uses trust. However, I, the way you've articulated it, also it seems to me trust, trust is, in my experience, here I'm flying back into my experience immediately, but uh, trust is not something that you sort of decide. It's, it's, it's more than cognitive. It's, it's trusting another to be the other uh, who uh, is, you know, that you can put that sort of trust in. I, um, again, I like the idea of meeting and uh, encounter. And he's really fighting a notion of faith as something that arises out of you in favor of faith as what happens in address, in encounter. Well, he's clearly always thinking of Schleiermacher. Yeah. That, that, uh, that account of faith. And for him, I mean, faith is trust, but it's also knowledge. And, yeah. and the knowledge comes in language. And um, uh, the language is always asking for further um, uh, interaction mm -hmm. with other language. And faith, uh, faith as knowledge, um, that seems to me a very Bardian kind of thing. Uh, uh, I can remember the impression it made on me as a student uh, to hear Bart say, uh, things like, uh, you know, the only difference between a Christian and a non-Christian is noetic. A Christian is simply somebody who knows something that a non-Christian does not yet know. And he, he doesn't want to make my knowledge in any way an achievement of mine. Uh, and also, he doesn't want to claim too much for my faith. Uh, faith is a gift. It's not my achievement. Yeah, I mean, that, I, I love my kind of view. Oh, don't take your unbelief that seriously. <laughs> he, he makes that statement explicit uh, on page 21. Uh, I do think we have been living in an age when we take our unbelief with great seriousness. And, and his view is that, and embodied here. The view is if you um, uh, if you take your unbelief seriously and think that you must give an account of faith in God that will defeat your unbelief then you have made unbelief more powerful than it is. And it should be. Uh, yeah. And now, uh, so the method is not yeah. Just, try to provide an account uh, that necessitates belief in God because yeah. that, that, that makes it something less than the gift. But faith is knowledge and it is a critical ongoing rational endeavor. One of the things that I think 
Bart does is refuse a strong distinction between um, faith and reason. Yes. I, I, I've tended over the years just to avoid the word faith and stress more faithfulness as part of what the formation of the language. Faithfulness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think, ooh, we do well to avoid both reason and faith uh, words. I mean, are, uh, because in our context, they have to be, I feel a story coming on. Uh, when I was at uh, YDS, I remember in, uh, it seemed like it was Rowan Greer's class, we had a Greek Orthodox priest come in and talk on the creeds. And he was talking on the Apostles' Creed and the creedal controversies in the fourth century. And an earnest young man, it was the 60s, uh, said, Father Theotokos, how, how can I say the creed with integrity when I have reservations about some of its claims? And Father Theotokos said, it's not that hard. You just repeat, you just say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty. It's, it's fairly easy. He said, no, no, I mean, how can I with, with integrity? Uh, when, when I don't believe uh, certain aspects of the creed. And this Greek Orthodox priest looked confused by the whole discussion. And he says, it's not that difficult. It's, it's only about uh, 40 or 50 words. You just say, I believe, it, just say, I, repeat after me, I believe in God, the Father Almighty. And it, so in great frustration, the young man uh, just said, I, 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 I just don't believe I should be up there acting like I believe when I don't. And the priest said, how old are you? And he said, uh, 26. He said, oh, well, uh, it, it takes some people longer than others. So keep coming, keep saying it. And he says, even if it never comes to you, who cares? It's our faith. It's our creed. <laughs> and I, I say at that moment, my whole epistemology from the 60s wilted. And uh, but that, that, that is a very kind of, seems to me, Bardian way of saying the, the creed is stating, if you will, a, a fact. That's a problematic word. But, um, and, and you, belief is an assent, but it's not more than that. And so. I, um, uh, living wisely is most basically a matter of attending to the right words. Mm. I, I love that um, um, phrase. And um, what Bart helps us see is how the right words demand to be related to other right words in a manner that helps us discover the grammars that are necessary for us to live well as people of God in a world in deep alienation from that God. Hmm. Yeah, and the word God being one of those, oh. one of the chief words we uh, keep getting, to get the word God right means Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, would, well, we've moved over to faith and knowledge, section three. He says explicitly here, uh, pistis, that faith, rightly understood is gnosis, knowledge. Faith is knowledge. And uh, he speaks of it as practical knowledge. I, I uh, it seems to me there, uh, we live in a, an, a culture in which um, uh, faith is experience. And if I say to you, if you say, why do you believe this? I say, well, it, I just feel this is right, or I feel it in my heart, or in my experience. Uh, it, no, Bart really, he wants to keep us over in the realm of knowledge, that to, to affirm Jesus Christ is to know something. And is, it is to know uh, an objective uh, knowledge. Yeah. Uh, you got to be careful with the word objective. But, okay. Uh, yeah. H how would you want to nuance that? Uh, the way Bart does? Or? 
I would want to um, say it's the kind of knowledge that we cannot live without and mm -hmm. that is therefore not um, that the very knowing, the kind of knowing that it is for Bart is the kind of knowing that um, must um, change the world because it is about the change of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd say he's fighting there what you have sometimes mocked uh, in American Christianity. Uh, I believe Jesus Christ is Lord, but that's just my personal opinion. Uh, he's really, after that, uh, I yeah. wonder, uh, you get into, uh, in section four, um, faith as confession, he says Christian faith is the decision, and boy, that's a loaded word in evangelical Protestant Christianity and all, um, but that to me here, he goes public with faith. Uh, here, he yeah, it has to be public. Yeah, it, it makes it, uh, hey, to stand up and say the Apostles' Creed is a public witness kind of thing. But here he gets into church and he gets into public life. And that he says Christians are not to live in a snail shell comfortably, but we are to be out. It seems to me this is, a, this, is, this is evangelism. This is witness. In 46, um, he was not just giving these lectures at Bonn, he was all over Europe. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was um, famously lecturing in Hungary and Czechoslovakia and responding to the communist takeovers there and also making Americans extraordinarily angry because uh, uh, he um, wouldn't uh, s seem to condemn the communist in the same way that he'd condemned the Nazis. Uh, and he was uh, just the setting of these lectures there in this ruined uh, Bonn University had fallen into the arms of the Nazis early on. Right. And uh, uh, boy, to, to, to talk about theology amidst the ruins, uh, which may be a segue to ask, uh, in a sense, we're having this theological discussion amidst some ruins. Uh, you and I are the only bodies present in the Divinity School at this moment. Um, and uh, I, I wonder, do you, what, what do you think, uh, why is talking about theology one of the most important things we can do in the present moment? Why is this not a waste of time? To training and learning to die. Training and learning to die. Okay, now you're you're saying that as a member of the high risk cohort, right? Uh, to someone who is, but why is that important? Because it helps us understand that um, there. That survival is not an end in itself, but simply part of what is constitutive of learning to live well as people who care about other people. And um, there, are some, there, there are ironies all over the, the situation we're in, in terms of the isolation that is uh, institutionalized and how as Christians we can uh, understand how the isolation itself may be a form of love as part of the great challenge before us. Mm -hmm. So those are the kind of You uh, sound like you said to me early on that you really you felt sorry for like pastors uh, who've got to minister uh, as people 
and two people who, who don't know they have to die. And that, it, 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 um, some, it, it, maybe this is a moment when if people have a renewed sense of their fragility and dependency and uh, maybe that's uh, a good thing. I, I, I would think one reason we need to study theology in such a moment is we don't have the skills to know what the significance of a pandemic is uh, along with everything else. Uh, we don't know without seeing through the lens of Jesus Christ and, and his salvation that we, we don't know what's important in the present moment without um, that. And this tells us how to think uh, about that. I, I know watching the 630 News, uh, a typical thing is uh, you just have, you know, report after report of this many died today in New York, oh, this many in New Orleans. Oh, well, now it's in San Francisco. And, um, and then the news always ends uh, with a feel-good story of a kitten that a little girl found uh, or a little boy that's writing notes to the mailman to thank him for risking his life to bring the mail. Um, and, and that boy, in the face of a pandemic, that's pretty small potatoes. And yet, if, if you don't believe in, in a God who is meeting us, uh, what do you say? And it does seem to me an opportunity for theological reflection and, and for preaching. Certainly, I think that. Um, just one what the flag one issue that i think will come up uh well yeah on page 33 where he talks about translation okay um where he says uh there must be translation for example into the language of the newspaper i mean he loved the newspaper what we have to do is to say <laughs> in the common language of the world the same thing as we say in the forms of church language I think that that's uh, quite problematic. Um, the, um, I wrote down in the margins, uh, dangerous. Yeah. Um, McIntyre, who's just a switch rationality, uh, argues using Davidson um, or against Davidson that you can translate a word or a sentence or a paragraph or even a book, but can you translate a language in use? And uh, Bart, philosophically, I think, hadn't thought through that. He always said, you know, that a Christian is someone that reads, has the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. And the question is getting them together. But the question is, is which newspaper? <laughs> <laughs> I, um, there's, there's debate if he said that or, or in the context of which he's, but yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it, he, he did say things like, uh, on that page and the page after, you know, oh, if in the 1930s, right. the German church could have spoken up with politically significant stuff. Uh, I, I think one of his problems is I'm not sure the German church had anything interesting to say, uh, to Hitler. Uh, and so it kind of capitulated. I, I'm thinking, I just heard a lecture on the Barman Declaration, which Bart did, and basically the lecturer was saying, uh, hey, Bonhoeffer, Bart, uh, none of these guys really challenged the political uh, moment. Uh, none of these guys explicitly uh, were busy publicly condemning National Socialism. Uh, Barman was not a, a political statement i would just say your view of politics is really limited there this is wrong <laughs> yeah and as i see the barman declaration i love it as a preacher because i hear bart saying hey hitler uh 
you 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 can do what you want to do, but you will not tell the church what to preach. Uh, we are free, and um, it, it does seem like like in the present moment, if you want to say something political. Uh, what would you say? I, you know, and I. Uh, it's very interesting to listen to. Um, the language of science will tell us what to do. I've thought, yeah. I suppose if, if our modern cultures are analogous to the dominance of the church in the Middle Ages, the dominant ideology is now science <laughs> that, the yeah. that has the authority yeah. structure to say this is what we ought to do. And uh, I've had to in my own anger about the national administration and the president and all, uh, you know, I thought I, I was talking with a young African-American pastor a couple of days ago, former student, and uh, I was speaking about the ineptitude of Washington and we got started too late and, and et cetera, et cetera. And he said, yeah, I don't know though if the, situation of of my people would be a bit different no matter who was in the white house <laughs> we'd be on the short end of any you know uh yeah and uh that sense that maybe uh i like the way that you you know spoke of death uh maybe we're we're seeing that uh uh the false gods are being exposed before we end uh, Bart does get into uh, briefly what he called in other contexts the first axiom of theology, and that is the first commandment. You will have no other gods before you. It does seem to me, 1930s in Germany, today during the pandemic, it is a season in which there is some exposure going on of our idolatries, and that's when it would be good to be the church to say, you know, if you've lost faith in that God, that's okay. That's okay. Uh, that God can help you. Well, we've been having a chat uh, coming along. Uh, Karsten, uh, what are some questions that people are asking, listening in on this theological entertainment? Good morning. Yeah. So Taylor Mertens threw a softball and it seems like there's a lot of people that would like you to hit it about when y'all were introduced to Bart and what your impressions of Bart were kind of on that first reading. I know you've talked about this a little bit already, Dr. Wilhelm. Okay. Uh, Taylor Mertens, former student of mine. Um, Stanley, how did you first be, were introduced to Bart? Um, I had read a Dogmatics and Outline, I think, um, in one of my early years in college, and I made no impression on me other than it's just uh, language on a holiday. But um, I um, encountered Bart in Mr. Hart's Systematic Theology. Uh, we read 2-1, um, I seem to remember, um, for, in Systematics at Yale. And I was really beginning to uh, um, appreciate uh, what an extraordinary uh, uh, production uh, the dogmatics were. I, um, you know, it goes back, I'd, I had thought if I were going to be a Christian, I would be a Talikian uh, of some kind or the other. It was uh, Bart's. Um, ability to stand against uh, the Nazis that really began to pull me in mm -hmm. to the um, uh, integrity of what he was about as a theologian. You know, I think as a, I also got dogmatics and outline as a sophomore in college, got nothing from it. Bart sounded like some kind of conservative or something. Uh, when I got to Yale, I think uh, one thing that attracted me about Bart was the people that I 
had learned professors I'd learned to admire, Brevard Childs, uh, Paul Homer, uh, uh, Hans Frey, uh, these people that we found so interesting, they all found BART interesting. So I signed up for Robert Clyde Johnson's class in uh, BART in which he just simply read through volume four for the whole semester. And uh, so I walk in, uh, Johnson always began class by lighting a cigar and smoking it during the seminar. Anyway, I walk in and I, I said, can I, if you got room, can I sign up for this seminar? And he said, uh, yeah, I said, uh, aren't you a Methodist? And I said, yes, sir, I, I, I'm a Methodist, but, and he said, all right, long as you understand now, this is against everything you believe in, but if, if you got problems with your background and all come on in. <laughs> and it, uh, and it was fun during that semester to kind of have my stuff rearranged. And uh, uh, I think volume four is a, a great place to begin. That's a great place. Karsten? Uh, uh, yeah, so you all have already talked a little bit about this question of the language of the church and the language of the newspaper. Um, but we've got some more questions, I think especially given the relationship um, that Lindbeck and um, Wittgenstein have played in y'all's formation as sort of um, post-liberal theologians about how you make that move from the language of the church to the language of the everyman, or Mr. Everyman, as Bart puts it, um, and how you do that in a way that's still being faithful to the language of the church where you're not sort of giving up everything the church has to be able to communicate to someone else who's not familiar with hmm. that language. Yeah, Stanley, you raised the issue of translation. Well, um, I don't, um, um, I think, like Bart presumes, um, without it becoming articulate, is a non-foundationalist view of truthfulness. By that, I mean, he doesn't try to establish a theory of truth prior to having the necessity to say what is true. And in that way, he enters in to the ongoing project of having to repeat himself differently time and time again in order to say what it is we say when we affirm Jesus Christ is Lord. And in that sense, um, Bart's theology remains open in a way that is a constant task for you rather than something that's just a given. Um, I want to recommend in that regard, Everhart Bush's The Great Passion, the book, The Great Passion. If you want an overview of how Bart works in that way, there's no one better than Bush. Mm -hmm. I, uh, when it, I, I think about Stanley's uh, comment, um, uh, you know, to be a pastor today is, uh, the best training is to have previously been a teacher of high school French and the same quality is required to pound French verbs into adolescent brains uh, can be useful in the parish. And that uh, basically all the theology that I got in college and coming into seminary was in the translation mode. Uh, you got modern, critical, sophisticated people. So you can't talk about heaven. Uh, you, uh, you talk about uh, the ultimate reality or destination. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I think, uh, you know, we've, we've, we've seen that the, you, you give away the store many times in such translation efforts. And uh, 
one reason I enjoyed being a college chaplain for 20 years here at Duke was when you're working with college students, you, you never have, it's rarely that you'll say something like redemption and the college student will say, whoa, whoa, no, you can't use language like that because I'm an American and I'm intelligent and I should be able to have access to all uh, language. No, if you're a college student, you're on vocabulary lessons all day long. Uh, otherwise known as physics or English literary criticism or whatever. And, and so Christianity, they, they kind of expect, I'm going to have to sit for the definitions. I'm going to have to say, can you help me? Can you unpack that term for me? What is the story that lies behind that? Or what are the set of practices that I need to take up in order to know what that word means? Uh, so, um, yeah, I think, and think of preaching as instruction and in how to speak Christian, uh, to quote another essay of Stanley's. Stanley won't let me quote from Wittgenstein because he says I don't understand him. But uh, uh, I found Wittgenstein helpful. Maybe one last question. Yeah, so on that topic of finding and, and learning how to speak Christianly and how we use um, words as Christians maybe differently. There, there were two words that kept popping up a lot in the chat and also in these chapters in BART, um, trying to figure out how BART's using them in a way that's perhaps differently than our uh, popular discourse. One of those is freedom and the other is science. Mm. So if y'all could take a swing at that, I think that'd be right. Freedom and what? Science. 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 We said a little bit about the science, but about, he does use the word uh, frequently in these four, four chapters on freedom. What's Bart talking about when he says freedom? I bet it's not what we're talking about when we use that word. He says on 29, Christian faith is the decision in which people, as he says men, but men have the freedom, said the opening sentence, and the public responsibility too. There is a permission granted to to men an open door and that means a freedom to freedom to freedom of trust and freedom of knowledge we must add freedom of responsibility here one freedom is inseparable from the other so freedom is um, um, a holding concept for a, a fundamental account of what it means to be a Christian. And therefore, it is not some thing in itself, such as freedom of choice and so on, but it is uh, to be called into a way of life that stops us from being dominated by our own desires. Hmm. I would think freedom is the freedom to be who you are called to be. Uh, I think of that as from Aquinas, but uh, who, who you've been created to be and not, uh, I mean, one thing around here, I think is that freedom means freedom not to have to self-create. Uh, it's a huge burden to tell me that I have got to decide my life into significance. And Mark kind of says, no, in Jesus Christ, you've already been decided for. <laughs> you've already, uh, you are not self-created. And to me, that's for kind of upwardly mobile, high achieving, educated people. That's that's quite a, a word of grace and maybe in the present moment related to your previous comments, Stanley, uh, to be in a culture that denies and so fears death, to, to be given some modicum of freedom from that fear completely controlling your life uh, and your decisions and all is, is that, that is freedom. Well, uh, let me just, Quickly, um, I think that we tend to think of freedom prospectively, namely, it's about, I, 
I've been determined in my life, but next time I'm going to get my principles straight, get my facts straight, and I'm going to freely make a decision. And the problem with that is, is that on retrospection, we usually discover where we thought we were making a free decision was in fact determined by presuppositions we hadn't really um, gotten a hold of. <laughs> and that means that freedom is much more a matter of retrospective judgments about decisions I made when I thought I knew what I was doing, but in fact I did not, and yet I must claim them as my own if I am to live well as a human being. And those are the kinds of complexities about living freely that is seldom um, struggled with. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I I go back to how Bart began uh, this this section with meeting. I think freedom is a gift that comes in being met. Uh, by the one who is uh, the way, the truth, and the life, and that in that uh, I, I am for the first time able to breathe. Uh, I, I am not as alone as I presume myself to be, therefore I am free. Uh, but well, hey, um, thank you, and thanks everybody for listening in, and um, just a reminder that this will be posted uh, on the website, uh, willwilliman.com, and there are questions there, and Ralph Wood's comments are there, uh, questions. And uh, here's a slide about the upcoming sessions uh, on Tuesdays, continuing into uh, through June 2nd. And uh, so, uh, thanks everybody for joining us and hope to see you again next week. Thanks, Stanley. So long, thank you, Will.